Hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Uh, welcome to the Forward to the Future series. Um, first off, I want to thank all the Diamond sponsors, um, ACOM, Transex, WSB, HDR, VHB, RSNH, and Kimmy Horn for their sponsorship to make site. And um, this year, we actually also have um, gold sponsors. So um, thanks to Rainy Camp, RKNK, Jewelry, Arcadis, and Atkins as well for being Nixite sponsors. Um, first off, I have a couple of announcements for upcoming um, webinars. So one thing for this, webinar um, the pds and pm information will be emailed to the account used during registration so if any of you uh, who are attending who you don't get it please feel free to email me my email is down there on the slide to you chair at nixsite.org and um second um southern district call for abstract uh, the deadline is going to be extended a little bit i don't have an updated date but you'll probably see an email come out soon as well as um, the call for registrations will be coming out soon as well. But for more information, um, 2021sdite.org is the website. Um, the next CEC meeting is uh, on Thursday, March 11th. Um, we have um, a presentation uh, on US 29 corridor study from Maryland. Um, during that presentation, so if y'all want, I'll send out the agenda soon to all TEC, but um, if you all want to attend, feel free to um, let me know if you haven't gotten the invite to it. So let's get started. Uh, I, I'm hoping there are no technical issues um, going anymore. Uh, and I'm going to share the presentation and have Chris Benson um, take on. Chris, I'm going to go ahead and start the slideshow. Uh, let me know if you're able to see. Oops. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I appreciate your hanging with us. I think the problem may have been that I had a whole bunch of updates that downloaded this morning and my computer hasn't quite caught up with uh, how it should respond with all those updates. So I do apologize for that and uh, we'll need to let Sravia know when to advance. So you're going to hear that a little bit, uh, but I hope we're going to have something that will help you out a little bit, give you some insight and uh, show you a little bit about how managed lanes are uh, going into the future. Shravya? All right, I do want to start a little bit by by what are managed lanes. And this is this is what I call the you say tomato, I say tomato uh, type of thing. Managed lanes are a lot of different things. HOV lanes were the first high occupancy vehicle lanes. High occupancy toll lanes are now prevalent. Uh, truck only toll lanes, there aren't any in the US right now. But going to special use lanes, that can be a truck only lane, it can be a bus only lane. We've got bus only lanes and the Georgia Department of Transportation is doing some truck only lanes. They're not gonna be told, but some special use lanes for trucks on I-75, basically between Macon and Atlanta. Express lanes have been coming into wider use and by express lanes, there are a lot of different potential terms for them. I'm talking lanes that everybody with the possible exception of uh, first responders and transit vehicles pays a toll. And then finally ramp metering. And you may think it's a little odd to see ramp metering and managed lanes, but that's it's essentially something that we're managing all the lanes on the facility, not just specialized lanes. Next, please. Okay, one more. They do take many forms. This is called the flag, and you may have seen it in one of its many incarnations. 
uh, as we move forward. It gets more complex practically every year, and you'll see this one goes all the way from HOV lanes to multifaceted managed lanes facilities using congestion pricing, managed freeways, and, and quite frankly, some fairly advanced algorithms. Next, please. Well, are they catching on? Well, I went back and took a look at where we were in 2003, and I want to stress that these are priced managed lanes, lanes where you can get in if you're an HOV, but also if you want to pay a toll of some type. Next, please. As you can see, they have expanded quite a bit uh, over the last 17 years. In fact, they're practically all over the country right now, a lot of different places, including here in North Carolina, uh, several in Georgia where, where I hail from, and we're seeing more and more and more. And it may be a little bit weird that I'm going to highlight the only one that was not successful but it's over in West Texas in El Paso. And that is the only HOV or priced express lane rather that has been decommissioned. And it was basically because they put it in an area which just did not have too terribly much demand. And without demand, you're not going to do get people to pay a toll to get in a special lane. But every other express lane, and there are more than 40 of them, uh, either under construction or in operation, is still going and still going strong. In fact, the uh, variable pricing project I put into place in Lee County, Florida, on one of its bridges uh, is still going strong after more than 20 years. Next, please. All right, uh, this is Atlanta, and I've highlighted Atlanta because we've got some interesting information on it and played a, a you know, a lot of different, I won't call it games, but a lot of different scenarios with it so that they were handy. And what you're looking at is I-75-85 connector, southbound is the direction that you're looking, right at 10th and 14th Street. Next, please. So I want to go back to Traffic Flow 101. Remember what you just saw. It's going to become important in a few minutes. And Traffic Flow really follows the law of diminishing returns. Uh, basically, if we've got a roadway with, say, 400 vehicles that want to go through in an hour, we double it to 800, and we are going to double our throughput. However, at some point, the law of diminishing returns begins to kick in. And as you can see from that dashed red line after we pass point DO, we're actually getting disbenefits when we add additional traffic and your flow begins to break down. So the big problem with congestion is not just the congestion itself, although that's obviously the most obvious benefit, but the real problem is the fact that we get flow breakdown. Next slide, please. This is just a scatter plot of speed versus throughput from the area we just looked at on the connector in Atlanta southbound. And as you can see, next slide please, it very well matches, next slide, that curve that shows us that a good bit of the time that particular area of the freeway is losing its ability to move traffic because of the excess congestion. Next slide, please. To give you an idea, next slide. In the morning, it tops out at about 1,600 vehicles per lane per hour. And the geometry there is complex enough that 1,600 vehicles per lane per hour is pretty good. I mean, it's far below the 2000 that we would normally like to see, but it is a complex area with a lot of weaving. However, by 5 p.m., that throughput has fallen below 800 vehicles per lane per hour. So we can draw one of two conclusions. 
either nobody in Atlanta wants to get on the freeway at five o'clock, which I can guarantee you is not true, or we are seeing congestion induced reduction in demand. And this was over uh, about a four week period, weekdays only uh, during, I believe it was October, 2017. Uh, but we've seen the pattern over and over. Next slide, please. In Atlanta, as you just seen, we're looking at about a 50% throughput loss. Doug McGregor uh, really broke ground in this particular area in Seattle with the Washington DOT. And he also saw about 50% throughput loss in the Seattle area, actually a couple of areas with as much as 60% loss. Portland, about 50% loss. And here in North Carolina, we've been looking at Raleigh and we're seeing about a 30% throughput loss during the peak of the peak. So this is not insignificant impact. If we could get this throughput loss back, we could make a tremendous difference in how well our freeways flowed. Next slide, please. And it's not just me. Uh, FHWA has, has taken a look at this and really it's very clear that if a relatively small change can be made in peak demand, then two beneficial things are going to happen. You're gonna get a major decrease in congestion. And perhaps the only good thing about the COVID pandemic has been that we've been able to see that in, in real life in a lot of areas, at least for a while, it's beginning to come back now, congestion basically disappeared. Uh, and it was not that we all of a sudden had volumes at half the demand, but volumes at 75, 80, 85 percent of the previous volumes were showing dramatic reductions in congestion. So out of COVID, we've at least got something we can begin to talk to the public about that they can relate to that talks about this phenomena that while you don't have to make huge changes in your demand, a relatively small change in demand will bring about some very good benefits. Now, what is not obvious, what has to be measured and looked at is the increased throughput along those roads during peak times of travel. And that is relatively, that, to me, you know, the, the congestion, the increase in speed is the icing on the cake. That increased throughput is really the cake. And that's what we're looking for uh, with managed lanes. Next slide, please. It looks odd. Next slide you get what is known as the empty lane syndrome. And you can see this is SR91 in Orange County, California, uh, just south, I guess really southeast of LA. And it's probably, it's the, the granddaddy of all managed lanes. Uh, I can't remember if I-15 was in San Diego was first, but this one by far is the more complex first one. and. Over on the right, you see each lane moving about 1,400 vehicles per hour, 25 miles per hour. And in uh, the um, uh, other lane, in the managed lane, while it doesn't look like there are many cars, each lane is moving about 1,500 vehicles at 60 miles an hour. But I'll tell you right now, your public can have problems with this because they're gonna go, why have you got all this extra capacity out there? Well, it's not really extra capacity. It's just that we've got the lane balanced such that we can move a lot more people through or some more people through at least uh, during the peak hour if we don't have as many people trying it exactly the same time. Next slide, please. So what are the various strategies that can be used for managed lanes? Because we're trying to get at least one lane and hopefully more than one lane, two lanes, and in the case of ramp metering, all the lanes, to be able to function much better than they can if we were to just allow everybody to get in there. The first one was eligibility, which could be type of vehicle. As you know, many HOV lanes across the nation will allow low emission vehicles to come into the lane just because they're a low emission vehicle. 
occupancy is a great way that's been done for for many many years the the problem with both of those is you can't tune it very very well uh, so unless I've got exactly the right number of cars of the right type or exactly the right number of cars with the right occupancy I'm not going to be using as much capacity in that lane as it's capable of providing. These were a great start, but I think we can move beyond that now. Next, similar is access control. How often, how often do we let people in? Just stay on that slide, please. How often do we let people in? Can they access it? Examples here would be something that really doesn't happen very often, and that would be through lanes. Uh, through an, an urban area. Uh, we see it with CD systems are, are kind of a, a surrogate for this where you've got your local traffic moving out and onto the CD system and your through traffic stays onto the uh, actual freeway facility. Congestion pricing is uh, coming on very, well, that's what drove that dramatic increase in lanes between 2003 and 2020. It was the advocation or the, the expansion of congestion pricing. And the other thing is a potential combination of those strategies. A hot lane, for instance, combines eligibility, occupancy, and uh, congestion pricing. So it doesn't have to just be one or the other. It can be one, or frankly, I guess it could be all of them. Next slide, please. This one goes back to the third variable pricing program brought on in the United States, and I am very proud to have been the project manager for it. Uh, exceptionally simple uh, pricing. We basically said, we don't wanna raise anybody's tolls. So on the shoulder hours, uh, we, we um, said, okay, we're going to charge people half the toll uh, that they would have been charged normally. So that's all we did, and it worked like a charm. We saw significant changes in the traffic pattern, and frankly, all people were saving in most cases was 25 cents, but it still had an impact on the traffic stream. And as I said, it's still happening today. Next slide, please. Next level up, I would say, in sophistication is a variable fixed pricing strategy. And that is SR91. There are others in the nation that do that, where you have a printed, posted toll schedule. So folks know exactly what they're going to be paying before they leave. It's pretty doggone effective, and it's worked exceptionally well uh, on the facilities that it is there. The biggest downside to it is they can only change these tolls uh, for SR91, it's every three months, and then they've got to republish everything. So in terms of being you know, very responsive to traffic, it isn't, but it works, and it works pretty doggone well. This has been functioning for almost a quarter century now, which is absolutely amazing uh, to those of us in the industry that we've been doing it for this long. Next, please. The most complex, uh, but not necessarily the most complicated, is dynamic pricing strategy. And it is based on the demand that is happening on the express lane at the time and tolls are adjusted to maintain the level of traffic on the express lanes at not necessarily full free flow, but definitely at the uh, speed, usually around 45 to 50 miles an hour that will maximize the throughput on that particular lane. Now, when we first started all this back in the, oh gosh, 1990s, uh, I used to think, gee, wouldn't it make more sense to have the algorithm take a look at what was happening on the general purpose lanes? And the answer to that is no, it doesn't. Uh, it was tried. I'm not going to embarrass anybody by saying where, but basically what happened is that the uh, general purpose lanes were 
congested as general purpose lanes are want to be. So it drove the price up on the managed lane, which made the congestion in the general purpose lane worse because nobody was getting in the managed lane because the toll was too high and it basically became a vicious circle. And so that particular agency did go back to uh, taking a look at what was going on in the express lane, at least as the main function. I also want to point out uh, the one, the, the uh, picture on the upper right is from USA Today. And I brought it in deliberately. I did give them credit. FHWA did the other one. Uh, but it was in something back in 2012, controversial hot lanes spreading nationally. And I'm looking at how many we actually have and going, gee, I understand that there is a lot of controversy to this. You've obviously seen it in North Carolina with uh, I-77 in Charlotte, but people tend to like them after they open and they have spread and I think they're gonna continue to spread. Next, please. I do wanna say just a little bit, I'm not gonna go into it uh, deeply because it could be a uh, presentation all on its own. Uh, there are the possibilities of using shoulder lanes. It's not as difficult as most people think and you know, is a little bit ironic, it's not as easy as most people think that it is. There are a lot of things to take into consideration what you're seeing in both of these photos and in the drawing above uh, from the Minnesota DOT is basically something where you've got control in all the lanes. The top one is not only showing that the shoulder is open, but it's even using dynamic speed limits. Uh, that is the best way to do it if you've got the funding to do it, but I can tell you there are facilities working pretty doggone well that are simply time of day with static signage saying the uh, saying the shoulder is open from this time to that time. Now what's not working so well, at least from what I've seen, is they usually post the speed limit in those at uh, a significantly lower speed than the general purpose lanes. The thinking being the general purpose lanes are going to be pretty crowded. People really aren't obeying those speed limits. They're pretty comfortable in the shoulder uh, going at near expressway speeds. Next, please. I do wanna talk a little bit about things that have changed over time with uh, expressways and with managed lanes. We used to feel like we really had to totally separate out the managed lanes from the general purpose traffic. And you'll see I-25 in Denver, the original I-15, it's now been upgraded significantly in San Diego, and I-10, which is the Katy Freeway, the old configuration in Houston, and all of those used hard hard barriers. Nobody was using pylons except for the trendsetters on SR-91 that were using pylons. But the thinking was that you cannot manage it without some type of major separation to keep folks from cheating the system. That may be true, but next slide. As we've gone forward, most express lanes today use some type of buffer, some type of painted buffer, usually a double white line. The lines can be anywhere from two feet to four feet apart, or as you can see here, probably even less. Uh, SR-167 is up in Washington State. To the bottom right, you see the double lines on I-85 in Atlanta. On I-35, going back to shoulder use for just a second, you're actually just seeing the yellow edge line uh, as being the delimitator between the shoulder and the general purpose lanes. And I did want to put I-95 in there. Uh, they do use pylons. Uh, it costs them about a million dollars a year to replace all the pylons that get knocked out uh, on their freeway. So pylons are nice, it, they do help. It does provide a level of comfort for drivers when there's a large disparity in speeds, but 
they can be very, very expensive to, to maintain. And you really have to balance, you know, what am I saving by getting more tolls and getting the lane to function correctly because I can manage it versus the cost of the barrier that you've got with hard barriers, with Jersey barrier type things being the most expensive because you've got the cost of the barrier plus the cost of right away, additional right away that you need. Next, please. Well, let's talk a little bit about occupancy enforcement. In other words, how do we determine that the folks that are in the lane saying they are HOVs are actually HOVs? And since hot lanes came along, to a lesser extent express lanes because uh, they really charge everybody, how we're gonna figure out who's really in there versus who should not be in there has been a major, major problem. And here's where I think we start seeing a little bit more about moving into the future. Next slide, please. Now go ahead to the next slide. In-lane enforcement, uh, which is basically you've got somebody out there putting eyeballs on the car to see if there are enough heads sticking up to allow them to be classified as an HOV has been going on forever. Uh, well, forever since we first came up with this hot lane idea. There are several ways that people can um, say I'm an HOV. This one again is SR91. They have a declaration lane. If you're saying you're an HOV, you've got to get over in a declaration lane somewhere along that. It's a little uh, box that every so often there's a highway patrolman sitting in that takes a look inside the car. Now the problem is that even if you think there are not enough people in that car, you got to stop them and you've got to actually look. So not a big deal to see, you know, if we could write tickets about, uh, you know, we looked in and we couldn't see but two people and this is an HOV three plus, uh, that probably would make it work. But the problem is to get into court and prove that they violated requires much, much more than somebody putting eyeballs on a car moving 60 or 70 miles per hour. So it requires a stop. Next slide, please. The problem with that is that it is a difficult thing and potentially dangerous. In fact, I know of states where the highway patrol has said, we're not going to enforce occupancy. It's too dangerous for our troopers and it's too dangerous for the public. So it has been less than successful, I would say. Next up, switchable transponders. Next slide, please. Kind of cool. Uh, it, man, I tell you, it's technology. And if you're a technology geek, you got to love it because you can tell the world whether you're an HOV or whether you should pay a toll with a flip of the switch or a push of the button. Next slide. The problem is you still got to stop them because you've got to be able to show that they had that switch in the wrong spot, that they said they're an HOV and they weren't. The flip side of that, uh, North Central Texas folks have been getting it on the Tex Express lanes for quite some time, are people calling in saying, gee, I was really an HOV today, but I didn't have my transponder in the right position. Can you do anything about it? And actually they did, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Lastly, photo enforcement. Next slide, please. This has been the holy grail since we first started hot lanes. Everybody has decided what we really need here are something that we can take a picture of so that it basically does the same thing as our eyes did. And there's a lot to that. It's, it's not unreasonable. And there is now an installation in Southern California on the I-10 and the I-110 that may prove that this is finally, after 20 years, gotten to the point where it is sufficient to go 
into court. I have a little bit of problem with it because it's fairly obvious where the uh, site is going to be to enforce the occupancy, uh, but that can also be with others also. But to me, it's kind of like when Henry Ford asked, why didn't you go out and talk to the public before you built the car? Uh, he responded, at least it's attributed to him, that if I'd asked the public what they wanted, they would have told me they want a faster horse. And so here I'm seeing the public has said, or the industry has said, we want something that will work like our eyes, and maybe we need to be looking at something that's entirely different. Next slide, please. So photo enforcement, the Holy Grail, next slide, please. There's an app for that. And I really think that this might be the game changer. Next slide, please. In fact, there are two apps for that. The first is called Go Karma. And this is what the North Central Texas folks did on the Tex Express lanes to get rid of people calling up and saying, hey, my HOV was, device was in the wrong spot. And I heard like three months, this was, it was first put into place in January of 2020, but I heard about three months later, they had not received a single call like that. But they've implemented Go Karma. And to me, the brilliance of it, and I do mean brilliance of it, is they stopped making it some type of traffic offense. They said, what we're going to do is assume that everybody out there is a single occupant vehicle unless they use the Go Karma app, which is connected into their back office, so that they can prove that they are not a single occupant vehicle. Go Karma has a major advantage in that it is fully automatic once you set it up. It basically looks for other Bluetooth devices in the vehicle and counts the number of those devices in the vehicle. They do have a way, I'm not totally sure what it is and they're a little closed about it and I can understand that, to be able to determine whether somebody is just leaving three or four Bluetooth devices in the car uh, rather than you know it actually being multiple people into the car. So they did tell me, yes, it can be beat, but you've got to work really hard to do it. So they, they've got the, the basics covered, and I think this one is going to be a game changer along with, next slide, Ride Flag. It is the second one that's out there. It's being uh, piloted in Utah, and I believe it's been selected for use in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's not quite as automatic as uh, Go Karma, but I really like the fact that all of the really private information stays on the phone. It doesn't use facial recognition per se, but basically you have one person, you only need one person in the car with a smart device, and you show the faces that are in the car to the device. And to make sure you're not just showing a cardboard cut out of Elvis, uh, they require something like a blink or a smile or something that shows this is a live person. Once that's in, like Grow Karma, it can communicate with the back office to say, this is a car with three people in it. This is a car with four, two, whatever it happens to be. One of the other things that I know Ride Flag can do, and it wouldn't be surprised to me if Go Karma could, is put up geofencing so that as you are approaching a, an entrance to an express lane, it will tell you whether or not you meet the requirements to enter that express lane at no toll or a reduced toll. So. I was in a meeting kind of like this with about 200 professionals and we were polled afterward when we'd had photo and basically these apps presented, which do you think is the way forward? Uh, most of us said, we think it's gonna be the apps. We'll have to see. Los Angeles, where they're doing the photo is gonna tell us a lot, but I gotta like this. And I've gotta like the fact that quite frankly, you don't have to just give HOV credits when it's on a freeway. You can give it 
on any street, quite frankly, that you want to, if you'd like to go down that road. Next slide, please. I don't want to leave this without talking about arterial managed lanes. Uh, I like them. It take this particular concept takes advantage of the fact that the lane itself is really not the problem, it's the intersections. And it basically uses a toll bypass to go over or under, as you'll see, go ahead to the next slide, of the intersection and allow the through traffic to have free flow, but particularly with the underpass to allow all the businesses on the corner to still have the same access that they had before the uh, told Q jump, we call them, actually took place. It is being piloted or I, something like this, you don't pilot after you spent multiple millions of dollars creating one, but down in Broward County, Florida, uh, they are actually putting this concept into use. And I'm very excited to see how this, this comes about. Reason Foundation, uh, along with yours truly, did a pretty major uh, uh, paper on this, and it is available through reason, reason.org. Just uh, uh, go ahead and search for Q-Jumps. Next slide, please. Equity needs to be taken into account in anything that we're doing, and tolling probably uh, is the place where it's going to be most front and center because you can see exactly that we're beginning to charge people to get into that hot lane. Uh, or if you're doing a full toll facility to, to be in the toll facility. But for our purposes here, thinking about hot lanes and express lanes, we are looking at some type of tolls. But the big thing, and I, I gotta admit, I get on my soapbox about this to really discuss equity you have to discuss both the impact and the mitigation provisions. Usually, if you only look at the impact, it's going to look very inequitable. However, if you can mitigate a lot of this, uh, the equity can end up being a non-issue or a benefit uh, even to lower income people. Next slide, please. I actually, in the early 2000s, did something called the road and the cow. And it contemplated the uh, passing of Beef 21, the Beef Equity Act for the 21st century. And it just kind of took a little bit of spin down uh, an imaginary lane. What would happen if we decided to price beef by the average cost per pound? And you can see this was 20 years ago because the average cost I came up with was about $3 a pound. It would be more now. But the basic premise is the same. And if you look at it, you're going to get overconsumption on the better cuts and you're going to get underconsumption on the cuts that maybe aren't so good. Kind of like you get overconsumption when you really need freeway volume uh, during the peak hour. And a lot of the time, a lot of that capacity just goes unused. The reason I did this is quite frankly, we've got a very good system. It's certainly far from perfect. But if you go into the grocery store, you're not gonna see prices that are reduced such that anybody can afford anything. Instead of doing that, we supplement the income for the folks that don't have the economic capability to pay the full prices. That works. It allows price to still be the thing that equalizes supply and demand. We need to start thinking about it possibly for roadways. Next slide, please. Real quickly, managed lanes benefits, reliable travel time, reduced delay, and more choices. It improves the system as well as the lane itself. It does encourage transit and carpool use, uh, preserves other options, decreases fuel consumption by reducing the congestion, improves air quality the same way, and it can generate some revenue. They're not great cash cows, but they do generate some revenue. Next slide, please. I'm gonna date myself here. Y'all are gonna know how old I am. This is uh, 
uh, the beaver from an old show back in the 1960s called Leave it to Beaver. And he was always talking to his brother, Wally, and it was always, gee, Wally, why did that happen? Well, gee, Wally, why would anybody want to put a toll on the freeway? And I would imagine most of you have heard, I've already paid for it. I don't trust the government with any more of my money. Tolls never go away. And in this case, they don't because we need it to manage the roadway. And then you can finally say unfair to, and you can fill in the blank with, with doggone near anybody you can think of. And you've seen it in North Carolina. You know that for something like I-77, uh, there is resistance. But I think what you're going to find in any one of these that you do is that the resistance will be the highest just before and possibly just after opening and then it will begin to fade away as people enjoy the benefits that that you're you're giving them next slide please two kangaroos and a wombat australian managed motorways uh this is basically ramp metering on steroids and it's where we get into the entire discussion of ramp metering they did some really amazing things uh, to reduce their congestion and increase, increase their throughput. Uh, we are about to launch a pilot on I-25 in Colorado. We're looking at it uh, in the Raleigh-Durham area and in the Charlotte area uh, with NCDOT, and we think it's got some real possibilities. But I call this two kangaroos and a wombat because the first time I saw this, I'm going, gee, a couple of kangaroos and a wombat in Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia, they don't have anybody there. Well, it's a city of 4.5 million. Next slide. <clears throat> Basically what it does is it controls every entrance to the freeway in the area being controlled. The Aussies basically give an example, imagine a stadium where half the gates people could get in free and they didn't have to show any ticket and as many people as wanted to could come in and the other half you had people that had to get tickets. People are going to flock to the places they can get in free and it's going to be a mess inside the stadium. Next slide please. Right now ramps are metered on a combination of traffic in the vicinity of the ramp or the, and the ramp queue. Now that's assuming they're not pre-timed but the next level of sophistication up is they look at the traffic in the vicinity and they look at the queue. Basically, the Australian method looks at condition of traffic everywhere in the corridor, looks at queues on the other ramps. It allows the ramps to talk to each other, to help each other out. It requires extremely accurate detection and a very sophisticated algorithm to run. Next slide, please. Here are the examples from the M1 uh, in Melbourne. You can see the before, it's a heat map, red's bad. After, in 2010, a significant improvement and it's still in operation today and it is spreading uh, throughout Australia. Next. The biggest downside to ramp metering, particularly the Australian version, is completely counterintuitive. I'm going to hold you up for a couple of minutes on the ramp and you're going to get home faster. People just don't understand it. It, it doesn't make intuitive sense and that's a difficulty. Next. Real quickly through the trends to wrap up, motorists are willing to pay for premium service. There is a growing interest in managing entire facilities. Portland, Oregon right now is looking at just that on I-5 and I-205. Uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing and I'm glad to be part of it. Equity and a high level of service are not mutually exclusive. <clears throat> For any elected officials on the call, I will tell you that you are the exception to this uh, statement that politicians are often two steps behind the public. If you're here this interested, that's not going to be you but you might want to help enlighten some of your uh, some of your peers. Finally, education of stakeholders is critical. The correlation between knowledge of and understanding of and the support for value pricing projects is is huge. Next. With that, uh, I think we went a little long because of our uh, problems at the beginning, but certainly uh, I love to talk about this stuff, as you can probably tell, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and if there are questions and we have time, I'd be glad to answer them. 
Hey, thanks, Chris. I have a few questions in the chat window. I, I did not say this um, in the beginning, but everyone, if you have any questions, you could either post it in the questions box or try to raise your hand. Um, so we can do both. I am going to go ahead and read the questions um, off the chat box and then you know look for any hands raised. So the first question, um it's a long question Chris, can you see the questions in the question box no i can't okay so i'm going to do that for you a primary goal of managed lanes is air quality yet many barriers have been among lane facilities restrict trucks and heavy vehicles is it not counterintuitive to restrict trucks but allowing buses from managed multi lane facilities when they have the occupancy or payment ability and there are more questions actually so is not performance in the general purpose lanes decreasing with more emissions um ps vdot allowed trust in the nova hitov lanes prior to the towing era couple of responses to that there are a lot of managed lanes in the united states that even though you tend to manage a managed lane at a lower throughput than you would for a general purpose lane, still because of the extreme congestion in the managed lane, the general purpose lanes also benefit. Perhaps the, the poster child for this is Miami on I-95 uh, where they had great success in the managed lanes, but the way they set it up, the general purpose lanes also improved pretty dramatically. We're talking 20 miles per hour uh, improvements in the peak hour. Now, as traffic has continued to grow, I doubt that that's still there. Also, interestingly, uh, the bus service that was there had to be expanded because they were running crush loads. So I think you can pretty well say that it did have a major significant impact on improving the overall uh, roadway, not just the managed lanes. So with the decreased congestion, you've got decreased emissions. With the increased transit use, you've got decreased emissions. So I think that quite frankly, uh, you're getting some some real benefits in air quality using a hot lane type of system. There was another comment there for that, Chris. Um, Northern Virginia toll lanes were almost forty to fifty dollars. So it's the same person, subject to husband, as a question asker. That's an extreme and very odd case. Uh, you're talking I-66 uh, in Virginia, and the tolls can get to be extreme, but that happens only about 1% of the time. Still, that's pretty amazing, but let's, let's look at what is happening there. Uh, I-66, the area that you're talking about, started as an HOV-only facility, and it was running at 50 to 60% of capacity just from the HOVs. So there was very little capacity that was realistically left over for the other vehicles to, to buy their way in and supply and demand, it, it occasionally goes absolutely through the roof. But that is not the kind of situation that you've got in 99.9% .9 of the areas around the United States. I'm trying to think of another HOV only where the entire facility is HOV only, and I can't call one up off the top of my head. I'm not sure there is one. So the Virginia I-66 is a very special case and nothing like a standard uh, HOV the hot conversion normally is. All right, thank you. Um, another question from Lynn Cornell. Um, has M1 success overcome the counterintuitiveness of waiting on the ramp? To some extent, yes. Um, 33 uh, major urban areas in the United States now have ramp metering. 
So it's not a totally foreign concept anymore. Uh, Minneapolis did something that, that quite frankly turned out to be brilliant. Uh, they have, they do have a pretty sophisticated ramp metering system uh, in the city, and it's been there for a while. And the people that were waiting on the ramps just absolutely couldn't stand it. They thought it was stupid. They thought it was wrong. They thought it was bad. So MnDOT said, let's turn it off and see if it gets better. Well, they turned it off and it got a whole lot worse. So people were actually saying, we need to turn this thing back on. And ever since then, it's been good. I used to live in California. We had a simple pre-timed ramp meter. The difference between traffic when that meter was on versus off was, was amazing. So maybe the way you do it is try it, pilot it, see, see if folks like it. If they don't, turn it off and see what they think then. Thank you. Um, any more questions? I don't see any more questions. Um, Chris's contact information is on the slide, last slide. Um, if you don't take a note and if you need it later, I can provide that as well. But thank you all for attending. Um, if you have more questions, you can reach out to him directly. I know he loves talking about this stuff, so he'll never... <laughs> Not an email or a phone call. <laughs> so um, feel free to reach out to him and um, we apologize for the delay in getting started, but thank you for hanging on and y'all have a great rest of the day. Thank you all folks. Bye-bye.